ankle fracture update. This is video two of four from the OTA Resident Core Curriculum Lecture Series version five, slides by Dr. Christopher Lee. I'm Saqib Rahman narrating, and we already went through uh, evaluation in the first video. So now we're going to talk about classification. So just a word on um, AOOTA classification. Uh, it works a little bit differently than some of the other fracture patterns because it really does take into account um, Weber classification um, to some extent, uh, which is which is really helpful. So the original Weber classification uh, is that a Weber A, it looks at the fibula, right? So a Weber A is a fracture below the plafond, a Weber B is a fracture at the level of the plafond, and a Weber C is a fracture above the plafond. And then the OTA classification, the AO OTA classification, to some extent, incorporates that in uh, the uh, uh, classification as well. Log Hansen uh, tends to be used a lot more in general, uh, certainly uh, in, in North America, and uh, it's based on the position of the foot at the time of of the fall. So, um, interesting, you know, cadaveric. Um, uh, studies done to uh, initially describe this. And it's interesting, in vivo, or we should say injury videos, um, showing how the fractures actually occur. So seeing a video of somebody getting injured, skateboarders um, um, provided great video evidence of this, for example. And the study was literally done looking at people who posted videos of their um, skateboarding uh, accidents and then how and then and the surgeon looking at like okay what fracture did they actually have and having good video evidence of what really happened showing that sometimes log hansen classification did, didn't quite predict the fracture patterns we were seeing nevertheless it's this is used so frequently you really need to understand it so supination external rotation one of the common fracture patterns you have this sort of injury that goes around in a circle right as shown in the on the top left so stage one is an aitfl ligament injury stage two is when you get this oblique and that's usually you're not going to diagnose that as a as a as a log hansen you know type one and i think these are very infrequently diagnosed just based on that alone it's usually when you get to stage two right and you have a fibula fracture with this very characteristic posterior superior to anterior inferior fracture line, right? That's the classic fracture line direction that you're going to see. Stage three, you have a posterior um, inferior tibia fib ligament disruption or a posterior malleolus fracture. Uh, and then stage four is when you have a medial injury, which is going to be a deltoid injury, a medial malleolus fracture. So it kind of goes around in that circle. So SCR2, there's that classic fracture pattern seen on the lateral. And you can see how on the AP, sometimes it's hard to see. And certainly when you're showing x-rays to a patient, they may not really see that at all. Uh, and you have to kind of point it out on the lateral. And here you can see it's an SCR2, uh, at least on static films, there's uh, no obvious medial injury, no medial malleolus fracture, no obvious ligament injury on the medial side. SCR4 um, is shown here, lateral malleolus fracture, small posterior malleolus fracture, definite medial malleolus fracture, and then that classic fracture line of the fibula. Now, the, the ligamentous SCR4, remember we said you could have a medial malleolus fracture or a medial ligament injury, you're going to see here, medial clear space widening. We say static, meaning that like on your injury films, you don't have to do a stress view to see this. Classic fibula fracture pattern, definite medial widening. So if you see an SCR, this is a big question that always comes up, right? If you see an SCR2, how do you know that it's not maybe an SCR4, that you're just not seeing widening on the or a ligamentous SCR4, and you're just not seeing the widening on the static view? So um, one thing you can ask and examine uh, at the initial point of care is, is there medial tenderness? You know, is there a deltoid tenderness? Is there medial swelling? Is there medial ecchymosis? And we all do that. Unfortunately, multiple studies have shown it's not that indicative of medial instability. Okay. So why does differentiating between an SCR2 and a ligamentous SCR4 matter? Um, well, um, couple of studies shown here, uh, 94 SCR2 ankle fractures followed for 16 to 25 years, mostly with pretty good results, no cases required salvage for post-traumatic arthritis, 
Another case, long-term follow-up. And SCR2 fractures generally do fairly well. Are SCR4 stress positive, meaning ligamentous SCR4 injuries that you only see when you stress them? Are these an indication to operate? So this is a good question. Um, And in a lot of training programs, you may be told that, well, if it looks like an SCR2, you have to do a stress view in order to determine, is it unstable? Is it a ligamentous SCR4? Because if it is, you have to operate. And But do you? So here's a multi-center, we're going to show a few studies. Here's a randomized multi-center trial. They had these. Uh, 41 were treated operative, 41 non-operative. No functional differences at any time interval, right? So there were some complications um, in both groups. So why the controversy? Well, um, there's biomechanical concern that you have increased pressure on the cartilage with this shift. We don't really have great long-term studies, and we, we do know that there's you know, a mean decrease in contact area of the tibiotalar joint, significant, uh, with even one millimeter of lateral tibial displacement. So the, the, the point is, even with a tiny bit of displacement, it really changes the mechanics, and you're overloading some of your cartilage, Right. So it's controversial. Um, fibular fractures associated with a stable ankle mortis will heal without significant functional consequence. I think we can agree on that. So you need to keep the talus under the tibia. And fibular fractures associated with an unstable ankle mortis heal with significant function, functional problems if the instability will cause a tailor shift. So the question to consider is, do all stress positive but statically congruent ligamentous SCR4 ankle fractures heal with some tailor shift without surgery. Meaning like, do you have to, you know, if you don't do surgery, are, are they going to shift? Um, so in this study, you know, we asked, are SCR4 stress positive ankles an indication to operate? So we looked at 38 patients, uh, stress positive, three required operative intervention, and they said, look, SCR stress positive ankles that are statically congruent can be treated non-operatively, uh, but they require close follow-up, right? Because they can move and you have to, you have to watch them very closely. Um, another indica- another um, um, paper, randomized prospective study, 81 patients, no significant difference in functional outcomes. So the conclusion was SCR stress positive ankles treated conservatively can have functional um, equivalent functional outcomes with surgical management, but there are higher risks of future displacement and non-union. So you just you have to watch them closely if you're going to treat them non-surgically. So still an evolving concept. The goal is still you want to maintain congruent tibiotalar joint with the plafond centered over the talus. If you're going to treat these non-operatively, there's a possibility of loss of reduction, so you need close follow-up. Um, and if that's not something you can do, you know, you can certainly offer the patient or it's not something the patient wants to do, uh, ORIF can be done and that can give you more predictable healing. Um, but it's not without risks. People get hardware complications, even if they don't have a complication, they just have painful hardware down the road, um, uh, that could require additional surgery. So you have to really have, um, a conversation with the patient and, um, you need informed consent of the patient either way. Here's an example, 29-year-old female uh, with a right oblique distal fibula fracture, SCR pattern, and a little bit of widening on stress view. Treated non-surgically, six-month follow-up, no pain, back to all normal activities. Not saying that this is absolutely what you need to do, but um, again, just in line with what we've been talking about. So, surgical treatment checklist. Address the fibula, right? Ensure that you have adequate length obtained, uh, use the contralateral side to evaluate this. I didn't talk about this, but there's something called a dime sign that you can see on x-ray sometimes that can help uh, let you know that you've restored fibular length. Um, with fi- fixation, you have to consider anti-glide versus neutralization plate in a lag screw, sort of classic AO techniques. Um, sometimes if it's very common, you might have to do bridge plating. Uh, posterior malleolus fracture, we'll talk about a little bit more in the next video. Uh, medial malleolus, if present, it's likely going to need to be fixed unless it's really, really small. Uh, and then we'll talk about fully threaded versus partially threaded screws. And at the end of your case, you typically want to stress the ankle for syndesmotic stability. 
Here's that dime sign I was talking about, which is if you have a fibular out to length, you will often see sort of this, this line here and this line here, kind of like a Shenton's line on a mortise view. And you can imagine that you could, like on a plain radiograph, and you, know, you could pull a dime out of your pocket and put it on the film and it kind of fits in that circle. That's where that dime sign comes from. We're using digital images now uh, for the most part uh, in many parts of the world. So um, that may not be, uh, and many parts of the world don't have dimes. So this is kind of for a regional specific uh, um, sort of um, comment. But nevertheless, that Chenton's line is something that might help you to identify your fibular length. And here you can see if it's broken, the dime is broken, it means that your fibula is short. When you have an SER pattern, um, you need to establish fibular length, alignment, rotation. Um, Anti-glide plates uh, can be done. It can potentially be stronger. They are not sitting directly lateral, so they can be potentially have better soft tissue envelope, although they're right in front of the perineal tendon, so they might irritate the tendons. Lag screw neutralization of plate um, is right under the incision, so not as ideal, although you could argue less likely to irritate the perineal tendons. And then once you're done, stress view, like we talked about earlier, and then decide if you need additional syndesmonic repair. Um, medial malleolus fracture, you have multiple fixation options. Classic AO techniques are with partially threaded cancella screws. Um, uh, you can consider, consider doing uh, fully threaded cortical screws as shown here. There is some biomechanical evidence, uh, at least, although we don't have overwhelming clinical evidence, but there is biomechanical evidence to show it has superior um, outcomes uh, in this particular paper. The um, where you place your screws um, can potentially irritate the posterior tibial tendon. So if you're a little bit more anterior, you're less likely to do that. If you're very posterior, you can imagine you're going to potentially irritate the posterior table tendon. So you have to keep that in mind. And sometimes you have to place multiple screws so you don't have an option to avoid, you know, that sort of zone two and three. All right, moving on. Supination adduction injuries, right? So in this injury pattern, uh, you have, um, you know, you sort of have the... Um, injury going this way, right? So there's sort of a tension-sided failure on the fibular side, right? And on the medial, this is actually an incorrect image here. Uh, on the medial side, you're actually gonna have a more of a vertically oriented fracture line, and you're gonna have more of a transverse oriented fracture line here, right? So apologize for that. Um, and what you often are also going to have is some impaction at this level here as the talus is driven up into that. So you're going to get, you're going to get this type of injury. Um, so tension side of failure laterally, compression side of failure medially. Here you can see that here. So transverse fibular fracture, failing in tension. So very different than the uh, rotational injury in the SCR type patterns. And here you will have more of a vertical fracture line, sometimes some impaction in that corner. Um, so beware of that intermedial impaction. Um, if seen on CT scans, uh, you may better identify what's going on there. It's a very small area. It can be hard to treat surgically, but you may need to, when you go in to fix your fib, uh, medial malleolus, um, explore sometimes uh, potentially uh, you know elevate and bone graft if you have extensive impaction there although it can be a tricky area to treat because it's not very well contained um, but you do need to look for that and uh, treat it accordingly so um, this is a fracture that you could also treat with an intramedullary screw right you have a very usually length stable fracture um, and uh, usually a fairly low fracture uh, and then on the medial side, rather than doing um, you know, screw-only screw fixation, you can see screw-only fixation is really not ideal for these more vertical fracture patterns, especially this, just tr this type of trajectory is good for a fracture like this, but not for a fracture like this. So this you may need to consider um, uh, like, like an, like an anti-glide plate, right? 
and then you have to consider um, reduction of that articular surface. So pronation external rotation, this is the next in the log Hansen classification. Um, here you're going to have um, a medial sided injury, uh, syndesmotic injury, uh, Weber C type fibula fracture typically. So this is usually a high fibula fracture or proximal fibula fracture, something like this. Um, so you'll also have potentially medial. So it's going to look in many ways like um, an SER type pattern, but typically you have a more proximal and the fibula fracture doesn't have usually that classic appearance that you do with the SER pattern. And very, very high likelihood to have um, syndesmotic injuries requiring um, repair. Um, so same goals, restoring fibular length and rotation, congruent ankle mortis, um, and you know, be prepared to have to do something to get the syndesmosis stable in almost all cases. Uh, here you can see there's actually a direct fixation of an extended posterior malleolus fracture um, and then repair of a extended fibular uh, or proximal fibula fracture. And then finally, pronation abduction, right? In this case, you're going to have a uh, transverse medial malleolus fracture or deltoid injury, PITFL or um, posterior medial fracture, posterior malleolus fracture, sorry. And um, the fibula fracture is a bit more of a compression. So you can have extensive comminution of the fibula fracture as it fails in compression, right? So in this, in this injury pattern, the ankle is going this way. This is getting compressed. And you're going to usually have some type of avulsion on the medial side. So pronation abduction, here you can say open injury, right? Um, here's your chance to look at the articular surface, for instance, but you can see high degree of comminution of the fibula um, due to the compression injury, tension injury on the medial side. So the medial malleolar fixation will drive stability to some extent. So and this is usually a simpler injury, so you can treat this first. And the fibula fracture usually comminuted so hard to get lag screw fixation in a lot of these patterns, or it may need to be a bridge plate construct. And then you're going to stress the syndesmosis last. All right, we're going to pause here. And in the next video, we'll go through posterior malleolus and syndesmotic injuries. There's kind of specific problem areas. Thanks.